A few days ago, I had the pleasure of taking a tour of some of the historic houses owned by the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. And in one particular home, the Crown and Shield Bentley House, which dated from 1727, I saw something rather curious. Uh, no, no, not, not the car, just, just a little bit higher than that. Uh, yes, yes, there you are, the curtains. You see, it's a rather strangely militant design for an early American house to have covering its windows, wouldn't you say? Now, naturally, when I first saw it, I immediately set to examining the uniforms on display to determine who exactly these men were and what they were doing covering up this window. As you can see, they have red coats with white facings, cocked hats, and note how those hats are raked off to the side, too, uh, white stockings, and curiously enough, black breeches. Their waistcoats weren't visible, unfortunately, but the uniforms were definitely in the same style of those worn during the American War of Independence, but before the, the uh, dramatic military reforms of the 1790s. I wondered if they couldn't be British regulars, and again, wondered why they would appear in a non-loyalist's home. Uh, but then, looking a little bit further, I saw their flag. Uh, curiously, only one set instead of the two which would normally be carried by regular soldiers, uh, being the king's colors and the regimental colors. The distinctive presence of a Celtic harp marked these men as Irish troops, and another curiosity, uh, those distinctive words which were emblazoned across the flag, loyal and determined. Now, whoever these men were, they had their own grenadier company, uh, musicians, and even a detachment of light horse. They also seemed to have a rather curious relationship with the local population. In one scene, individuals of seeming importance were being brought in by carriage to treat with officers in their mess tent, while in another scene, we actually see lower orders seemingly being chased off with sword or bayonet. So naturally, I asked my guide about the pieces, and they were later able to get me a sheet of information on them. Well, it turns out that these were reproductions of Irish block-printed linen curtains dating from between 1782 and 1790, portraying the review of the Irish volunteers by their general, Lord Charlemont, in Phoenix Park, Dublin, the 3rd of June, 1782. To put a long story short, the Irish volunteers were locally raised, note, not raised by the state, regiments of militia from 1778 through to the end of the American War of Independence. During the course of the war, of course, large portions of the regular standing army were sent overseas, be it to America or otherwise, and this meant that when France entered the war formally, Britain itself, and by extension Ireland itself, came under threat of invasion. As part of the efforts to help defend against this very real possibility, the Irish volunteers were raised. Although, in practice, their organization wasn't really viewed as terribly likely to actually help repel enemy forces, and they were more planned as sort of a policing force, able to keep control in the country while the regular forces were away fighting. However, despite this less than savory purpose of domestic control over defense, uh, their ranks swelled, and it wasn't really long before the Irish volunteers became quite a force to be reckoned with, so much so that they even began to exert political influence of their own. Perhaps they took inspiration from the American revolutionaries. Indeed, many Whigs over in England were doing the same thing. And the Irish volunteers soon enough began to not only disperse demonstrations and rebellious crowds, but they kind of became one in and of themselves. They began holding reviews and parades in city centers with the purpose of not just examining, making sure that they're ready for a possible invasion, but of demanding an end to the Navigation Acts in Ireland. Indeed, the American colonies weren't the only ones to not have free trade within the British Empire. And these Irish soldiers would parade under arms with slogans of free trade or a speedy revolution and other phrases threatening a literal armed insurrection were their economic demands not met. As the British Parliament was already going through something a little similar across the ocean, you can imagine what kind of impact that this sort of thing would have had on their minds. Except this time, the Irish were starting off much more organized and much more mobilized than the American colonists ever did. In 1782, nearly 200 delegates from the various volunteer corps all met at a central location in Dungannon, where a convention was held. And there, at the convention, they drafted demands to the British government while simultaneously confirming their loyalty to the crown. 
And as a result of those demands, the Irish Parliament was actually given a lot more legislative authority, a lot more legislative independence. But again, still very much within the actual British system, kind of like what the American rebels were aiming for really early on with their own efforts before it turned into, well, an outright war. Now, after this, the first Dungannon Convention, uh, the Irish Volunteers would continue as a force, and there would be more conventions with more demands and more discussion of particularly Irish affairs. But once the American War of Independence ended, they began dwindling in numbers, and those conventions started becoming less and less significant. And there was also a lot of infighting, politically speaking, amongst these organizations, and they didn't really uh, have such a united front to present to the British Parliament going forward. Until, eventually, uh, there were a few reforms to Britain's militia laws during the Wars of the Revolutionary France, and those effectively outlawed and ended the Irish Volunteer Service. But still, the question does remain, doesn't it? Why have these replicated curtains in a Salem-based home of all places? Well, apparently, during the late 18th century, the town of Salem, which was actually a very significant port, it was economically a very important area, received an influx of migrants from Ireland. And while William Bentley, the chief figure who lived in this home, was not one of those migrants, he was still very keen on supporting that community. And that is, of course, to say nothing of the fact that the American population potentially found some similarities between their own early cause and that of the Irish volunteers. So you can imagine that decorations like this may have become relatively popular among certain social circles here in Salem and across the United States. So as it turns out, this curious little set of militant curtains in a little historic house in Salem was able to open up a whole new chapter of British and Irish military and social history that I had never even heard of before. And, well, I hope that it was of interest to all of you as well. But, of course, that wasn't the only curiosity I found at the Peabody Essex Museum, although I'm afraid the next piece is a little less educational. But before we get to that, I have to do a little advert, don't I? Uh, yes, this time for Audible. You know, uh, audiobooks and all that. Uh, I'm not being sponsored by them, I, I just have a referral link that pretty much anyone can get, in fairness. But hey, if you want to get into audiobooks and you want two free audiobooks, just use the link down below. Uh, you get two free audiobooks of your choice uh, with a month of the service for free. And then if you decide that you don't want to stick around with the service and get another audiobook every month is how it basically works You can just cancel it and you still get to keep the books that you got from the first trial So it's no risk to you It only takes a couple of seconds to click sign up and then again you get the two free books I get a couple of dollars. We're all happy. It's a win-win uh, So yes, if you are so inclined sign up using my link in the description down below uh, Right in any case, sorry back to the video deep in the recesses of the Peabody Essex Museum's maritime section I found this series of paintings Beautiful, mournful pieces by John Cleveley the Elder, who lived from 1712 to 1777. Collectively, they are titled The Burning of the Luxburg Galley, and they show, well, exactly what you'd expect. The museum's description reads as such. The hopeless situation of the parties, the length and degree of their sufferings, and their melancholy resources to preserve life are circumstances that cannot fail to excite the tender feelings of the humane and benevolent. Survivor William Boys, 1787. This series of paintings depicts a dramatic story of death and survival. On June 25th, 1727, while on its way to London after delivering enslaved Africans to the Caribbean, the Luxborough caught fire when two boys ignited rum leaking from a cask. Sixteen crew members died when the ship exploded. Twenty-three escaped by boat. Lacking sails, the survivors sewed their clothes together to contrive a rig, then headed northwest towards Newfoundland. The men had no food or water, and some died. The others resorted to cannibalism. Twelve days after the explosion, seven men reached shore. One died shortly thereafter. Beautiful and tragic, to be sure. But hold on now. Did, did you notice anything off about it all? And anything just a little bit funny? Let's go back to that description, because this is meant to be a depiction of an event in 1727, painted in 1759, by a man who died in 1777. And yet, when you look at the first piece in this series, we see this, a flag which dates distinctively and definitively from the 19th century. You can see in the corner of this ensign the British flag, with the crosses of St. George for England and St. Andrew for Scotland. 
And that, of course, was the British flag from 1707, uh, when those two kingdoms joined to form the United Kingdom of Great Britain under the Acts of Union. However, the British flag changed in 1801, when another Act of Union placed the Kingdom of Ireland into that same system. This meant that the Cross of St. Patrick was added to the flag, creating what we recognize today as the national flag of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, or today of Northern Ireland. This flag dates from 1801 onwards. It did not exist in the 18th century. But go back to that ship and here we have it, a flag supposedly painted by a man who died 24 years before it even existed. So this left me very confused, and the way I see it, there are a number of possibilities. One, the museum just outright got it wrong. I don't think that's terribly likely, uh, but then I've also seen other museums of equal standing make mistakes like this before, so it's not totally outside the realm of possibility. Now two, I think it's much more likely, the painting was at a later point in time altered or adjusted in an attempt to correct or update the flag, uh, likely out of ignorance, but I, again, I do think that that is the much more likely case. Uh, three, the 1801 flag was indeed used in some instances before 1801 that I'm just not aware of. That's still possible. Uh, after all, the 1707 flag, the first one, was actually used in a different context before 1707, and particularly on ships. Uh, but through all my research, I've literally never seen anything like this, at least not that I can remember at all. So I don't think that the flag being accurate to the 1720s is likely at all. Four, John Cleveley the Elder was in fact a time traveler. Uh, the jury, though, is still out on that one. So I took down all the information on the piece, and I reached out to the museum's curatorial staff to see if I could find any answers. They never responded to me. I'll be sure to post an update if they ever do, but don't hold your breath, it's, it's been quite a while already. Now, in further credence to the idea that these pieces were later altered after the case, after the original painting, uh, the Wikipedia page for the actual ship does mention that, quote, another series of small paintings attributed to John Cleveley the Elder in 1727 are assumed to be reproductions of the same. These were acquired by the Greenwich Hospital and are now part of their collection held at the National Maritime Museum. So I think it's more likely, again, that the paintings were altered in that reproducing process, although the year that's listed there, 1727, uh, doesn't match with the information that the museum provided. So it just goes to show that a museum can be quite a wonderful place to learn about all sorts of, of new and exciting history, about subjects that you've never even considered before, and you can find them in the strangest places as well. I never expected to find an example of Irish militia in the Crown and Shield Bentley house of all places. But, of course, it's also wise to never place complete faith in these museums, because if nothing else, you might not get the full story from those little descriptions that they're able to provide. And even worse, the museum that you do get might even be wrong at times. So always exert caution and always confirm the information with another source. Thank you all for watching, of course, in particular to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on with the work that I do. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants.